da Covid-19 a Covid-19 to sustainable uh, development transition policies. We will have uh, Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Grinspan, Secretary General uh, Ibero-American Secretary General, mediated by Richard Martinez Alvarado, Vice President of uh, IDB countries. Uh, she is from Costa Rica and uh, she has an international path in the uh, in uh, development financing and she has been Deputy Secretary of um, UN and uh, also UNDP. She has been uh, active in several high-level uh, panels. Richard Martinez Alvarado uh, from El Salvador and uh, with a very important career in sustainable development and uh, also having been a Minister of Economy and uh, Development and also member of uh, uh, Climate Action uh, Forums. And uh, we will have a one hour panel. So it's a great pleasure to invite Mrs. Uh, Rebecca Greenspan uh, for, for um, for her presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. This side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Good morning in the other side. And it, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I want to send special, a special greetings and, and uh, to Sergio Guzmao Sushodolsky. Uh, Sergio, thank you again for inviting me to this very important forum. We were together not long ago in the forum that you organized also for the subnational development banks. Uh, that is uh, uh, the launch of this wonderful network uh, in Ibero-America. So thank you very much. I, I, we really think that this is a very important move for what we have to face in the future. So thank you so much, Sergio, and, 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 and my, my warm regards. And I want to say hello to Richard Martinez. Richard, a, a, a great friend, very nice to see you now in your new endeavors in Washington, in the IDB. And thank you for being, being with us and, and, and to share with me this opportunity. A, a, of the Development Forum. So good morning uh, to all the rest, all of those that are watching us. And I, I would really like to thank also the Brazilian Development Association and it's uh, for, for this wonderful invitation. And uh, as you can, you will see from, from my uh, presentation, uh, we have a lot in common with the goals and the objectives and the themes of discussion with the Brazilian Development Association. So it's, it's an honor for me uh, uh, to, to be here with you all today. Before I touch upon this very important matter, I must uh, in, in a way contextualize the, what COVID-19 has uh, mean for, for Latin America. So let me start by saying, because this will be I think part of uh, what we will face for the future in terms of the discussion, yes? Uh, maybe I would say something a little, a little bit uh, um, risky, <laughs> but uh, in a way, I really feel that we are starting the 21st century. <laughs> I don't think that centuries start chronologically. You know, the, the 20th century, century started in, in 1914 with the First World War, in a way. And uh, many, many uh, of us think that in terms of the impact that this pandemic is having on our daily life, on the daily life of uh, thousands of millions of people around the world, so we are witnessing the starting of a new epoch a new century that uh, where a lot of the tendencies that we saw coming and developing in technological terms, in the biological terms, in terms of the ecology, in terms of what was happening in all these areas crystallized in just now, you know, in a way, it's, it's a qualitative jump 
from where we were. So many, some think that we will go back to the old normality. And I really believe that we are going to something new that is just taking shape right now, but that will it mean the start, as I said, of really now of a new moment, of a new century. And in that sense, in a way, we have just to try to go to the new paradigm. Yes? In, in terms of how we measure development, because if we in Latin America, as I will say later on, we lost decades, not months, not years, but decades of progress in terms of social and, uh, socially and economically. It means that what we call development was very fragile. And maybe part of it is because we are measuring development in the wrong way, because we still measure development uh, by GDP. And we need to go to a multidimensional and complex measure of what we call development. So we will be aware and of, of the fragilities or the gaps or the uh, uh, differences that within that GDP measure are lived by different groups in society. So inequality, sustainability will have to be part of the new measures of development. So we can take the right policy, the right development policy, eh, because we see a more in a more in, in integral way what development is. This is, for example, one point. My second point is that we need to measure differently poverty and go, as many countries in Latin America has done, go for a more multi-dimensional measure of poverty. So the, the fight against poverty can take into account not only income, but the other basic needs or, that have not been met by many in society and take care also of the vulnerable groups that are very similar to the poor, but may be out of the scope of policies because we have the wrong measure for it. And the same happens around the world. And this is one of the points that I also want to make today. That is that Latin America, together with Southeast Asia, are the largest middle income region in the world, after China and India. Latin America is larger than Russia than the, and, and the former Soviet uh, republics, larger than the Arab world, and larger than Central Asia. But because we categorize the countries in the world according to GDP, so we are out of the scope of many of the cooperation uh, 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 the instruments that we have around because we still are in the paradigm of the 20th century. We still are in the paradigm of the Millennium Development Goals. We haven't made the transition to the SDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals, that need middle-income countries to be partners of the effort that the world has to make to meet the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. So, for example, in our region right now, we so so the 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 whole cooperation arena, the whole cooperation space also has to change with the new paradigms of the 21st century. So, what has happened in Latin American and in, in, in the Latin American region? As we all know, uh, the pandemic came in a moment when we were weak. We had five years of the pandemic of very low growth in the region. And we started to see already during those years a retrocess 
in terms of the gains in inequality and poverty that we've done at the beginning of uh, uh, the, the years 2000. From 2000 to the middle of 2014, 2015. But after that, growth was sluggish and retrocess in many of the indicators was already showing. And so we were in a weak moment when the pandemic struck uh, in our countries. And so that's why uh, the Latin American region has been one of the worst hidden uh, by the pandemic. In a way, we say that the juncture met with the structure. <laughs> yes, the, our structural deficit were there, and so the pandemic deepened our uh, in a, uh, uh, the, the, the gaps in terms of access to quality of services, of uh, in, in health and education, the gaps in access to the, to the digital world, the gaps in productivity that we had around our productive structure, the gaps in terms of a, a race and gender that uh, we experience also in, 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 in our region. So the pandemic did not invent those gaps, those structural deficits. What the pandemic did is deepen them, uh, uh, make, make them worse, make them wider. And that's why if it's if it, 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 it true that the hit in terms of uh, GDP, the fall in GDP is similar to what Europe is going through, the truth is that Europe will recover much faster than our countries. And so the IMF uh, is uh, projecting that we will uh, regain the GDP per capita, the GDP per capita that we had before the pandemic, only in 2025. So think about it. We had before the pandemic five bad years in terms of growth and social indicators. And if we only recover by 2025, we can talk again about a decade of bad results in economic and social terms in Latin America. So many are already talking about a new lost decade, like the 80s, yes, a new lost decade for Latin America. So here is where I want to stress my, uh, my uh, message to all of you, because I don't think that we need to accept that pronostic. I think that there are reasons to think that we can uh, overcome this pandemic going to a new paradigm of inclusive and sustainable dynamic growth. That is not a destiny that we have to accept, but it depends on what we do and it depends also on what the world will do because we will need the international community to get out of this. We will need the development banks, Richard, that have been ready to help, but we need to strengthen the development banks for them to be able to help even more. We need the national and subnational development banks precisely because of the things that Amina Mohammed in his address to all of us said. So we need to the instruments we have to get out of this pandemic stronger, but a, a, a conscious and aware of where the structural deficits were. And that's why this is my second message. My second message is that if we only go out of the juncture, but not look at the long term, at the structural, objectives that and changes that we need to address. So it will be a bad recovery. <laughs> Not everything 
that will happen can be named recovery. If it will be a recovery with more inequality, with more poverty, with more unsustainability. So I think that the word recovery is too big <laughs> to describe something that will be so weak. So we need to have a recovery that will be, as I said before, more inclusive and more sustainable. And what are the elements that have to be looked at? What are the good news and what are the spoilers that we need to address? And here, let me go to, to, the, to the last part of my, of, of, of my presentation. Well, I think that there are reasons to be more optimistic than many of the pronostics, okay? Um, so reasons for optimism and reasons for, a, a, for concern. The first reason for optimism is that we have gone, the society has gone through what we call compulsory digitalization and innovation. Yes, we did in several months what we were supposed to do in several years in terms of entering the digital world. Now, Latin America had before not, not about infrastructure in terms of digital infrastructure and access. But in a way, if you look at the numbers, we use the digital world more for the networks than for production. <laughs> and so productivity didn't grow fast. Even if digitalization or the digital world was already present, everybody with a cell, with a smartphone, but, or many, or many, but two problems. One, as I said, we use it more for our spare time than for our work. And I think that that has changed during the pandemic. And the second problem was the inequality in terms of access to the digital world. Small and medium term, uh, medium sized enterprises didn't use the digital world for their a, 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 a model, a, a, the, 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 the new private sector models, let's say, to enter into a more competitive and productive world. So now is the time to help close the gaps and use it also for our uh, productive matrix. So we can jump in terms of productivity for, to, the, to the new world, to the future. So that is a huge opportunity. The question is, are we going to take advantage of it? Uh, and, and I start also by the government. Uh, citizens are more digital than governments. <laughs> we need to also make governments and services enter into the new world. Uh, not only uh, the private sector, but also the, pli uh, the, the public sector and close the gaps. One of the things that I, I want to put as an example in this, uh, in this uh, note is that uh, according to the, to to the uh, to some of the new uh, the, the research that has been done during the pandemic in terms of education, for example, I am struck by the fact that uh, many of, uh, of the new studies suggest that we are going back to the gaps we had in education in 1960 because of the lack of access of the uh, most vulnerable groups to really join this effort in terms of education uh, in a remote mode. And many, we are fearing a lot of uh, uh, dropouts from school, from universities, from middle schools. So this is a huge effort that we have to do. Digi the digital world is an opportunity but only if we take it seriously, we go for the infrastructure that is needed for universal access to close the gaps and make this giant jump that we can 
make for the future if we do the right thing. My second reason of optimism is the green economy, <laughs> the transition, the ecological transition that we all have to make. And I think that this can be a new engine of growth in our countries, especially in Latin America, because we have a, 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 a citizenship that is very aware of what a, a sustainability and the environment means. We have a make, an, a, an energy matrix that is very clean. And even I think that we are leaders in the world in terms of renewable energy. That is a huge source of growth and sustainable growth for the future. So the green and the blue economy, because also the oceans <laughs> are a, a, a big source of opportunity and change uh, for Latin America, an engine of different, a different growth for the future. If we take advantage of it, and we have the private sector with the capabilities for it, we have the demand of the citizenship, uh, we need the right public policies to be able to go through it. But the green and blue economy are a great source of opportunities for us and also for a better distribution in terms of the territory, you know, to close also the territorial inequality that we have in the region. My third source of optimism is the growth in China and the US. <laughs> China is growing in a V form very rapidly. And so we are seeing again the rise in the prices of food and raw material. So many are already uh, talking about a, a new super cycle of raw materials and food prices in the world. Now, that's a possibility, an opportunity for a, a, a precisely or, or, or mainly for the south part of Latin America. But I hope this time we use it also smartly, not to reprimarize our economies, but to go for a more value-added science and technology and, a, a, a com and, 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 and more competitive a, a way in the in the value chains in the world and in the region. So if we use it well, this can be also a source for more inclusive and sustainable growth and opportunity. And also the growth of the US can be a great source of opportunities for us because they are betting on a more green growth. And they will invest a lot and also the growth of the U.S. can really help the north of Latin America, Mexico and Central America can benefit a lot from uh, dynamic growth in the U.S. The world as a whole, China and the U.S. are the two big economies in the world. But the thing is that it has to be a different growth, <laughs> a growth that will be, as I, we said, more green and more inclusive. And my fourth uh, reason for optimism is our young people <laughs> and our women. We have the cohort of young, the largest cohort of young people between 14 and 29 years of age. It, this is, uh, and they are the most educated cohort of young people we have ever had in our history. So give opportunities to the young and in a more equal way between men and women. Our women will be a great source of productivity and of growth if we really take this opportunity for uh, taking this into account, not, not as an afterthought in our model of development, but as a main part and pillar of the recovery. So let me go very uh, quickly and, and to give Richard uh, the time to, to, to come in. 
uh, there are spoilers. So what are the main spoilers? The first one is vaccines. Access to vaccines. Vaccinating our population is key for our recovery. And to avoid that the, 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 the problem that the short term will become our long term, <laughs> that the pandemic will make so much damage that to repair it, we will have to go two decades uh, from now. So I think, Richard, and you will correct me when you intervene, that in the, in the projections or, or calculations of the IDB, every trimester, of delay in vaccination means 2.5 percentage points in our GDP growth for recovery. So every trimester we delay vaccination for everybody is a huge problem for the recovery and the long-term perspective of our region. And there we need everybody, but we need the international community. We need to strengthen the instruments that will allow the universal access to vaccination that we need and to understand that vaccination is a public global good and that nobody is safe until we will all be safe. And that was precisely the main message of the summit of the Ibero-American summit that we just had at the level of heads of state and government. So this is the first, health and vaccination are key for our recovery. My second point is financing. We need more financing because the developed world has a invest or a, in, in, in a power in, into the economy four times what the Latin American countries has, have been able to do. And Brazil has done a lot, for example, according to, to, to ECLAC, is the second country that has invested more uh, in terms of uh, GDP in the pandemic, but still is four times less than what the developed world was able to do because they have the monetary force and, and strength to do that and that we don't. And so we need the IMF, the World Bank, to come with the new instrument. We have been adamant of the special uh, uh, drawing rights uh, for the region, the importance of a new facility uh, for uh, to strengthen our capacity to invest and to counteract the effects of the pandemic. And so the, 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 the development banks here, they have to play a major role because we have to strengthen our money, monetary stability, but we have also to strengthen our a, a fiscal space to be able to make the investments and in, the expenditures needed to support our a, a small and medium enterprises to support our families and the people that are unemployed because of the pandemic and the big hit that it has done in the incomes of the most vulnerable and poor of our region. And uh, so if Latin America won't get out of this moment and in, of this crisis, the worst crisis we have ever had in the more than one century, unless we will have also the international financial help that these countries deserve today. And it, it, let me remind everybody that the middle income countries are the ones worst hit in this pandemic. And in 2008, that wasn't the case. But in this crisis, this is the case. And so we need to include the middle-income countries in the cooperation uh, uh, efforts and in the international financial efforts uh, with new instruments for our country. And the last two spoilers, sorry, 
there is a the political spoiler. <laughs> we need to agree on the main things to go ahead. And we are entering a, a very political cycle of, uh, of elections in Latin America. And we are seeing a, 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 a polarization around. And we need to get to main basic agreements between the public sector, the private sector, and the civil, uh, civil society to bring this to a, to a different level of agreements. So we need a new social contract in a way. <laughs> we need to agree on the basics of what we are going to do to counteract the pandemic, but also for the future. And in a very electoral mode, uh, this is difficult to achieve and it needs a, a, a huge a efforts from all in society for this to be able to happen. Uh, I think that uh, the pandemic has put into a uh, new light the importance of public policy, of the public space. Uh, uh, and, but I think that it will be a mistake to think that public policy and public space is only government. We need the private sector because without the private sector and new public-private partnerships, we won't be able to do the investments needed for the new century, for, for this new economy. So it will be very important to have that conversation. And let me let me finish here saying that we don't have to uh, take as a given that we will have a lost decade in Latin America again. It depends on what we do, and it depends on, of the, on the strength of our voice in the international community for the right decisions to be taken and to push for a new partnerships in the world with the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals always in our horizon. We have opportunities and we have a, 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 the, the spoilers and the problems that we have carried out for so long. But multilateral, in a multi, if we face this crisis, strengthening the multilateral instrument and community and strengthening our capacity to agree on the basis, to take advantage of the new opportunities, this could be a new era in a new normal that won't be only new, but it will be better for all. Thank you. This is Rebecca Greenspan. Uh, thank you once again for your important lecture, which will certainly motivate the discussions that we will have from now on. Now, the considerations by Mr. Richard Martinez Alvarado. Welcome. The floor is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Bon dia. Uh, good afternoon, Rebecca. Uh, happy to see you again. It's a great honor to share this uh, this forum with a great friend of Iberoamerica, uh, just like you. I would like to thank the Brazilian Development Association, a historic partner of the IDB group, for the opportunity to speak uh, today and to, to thank uh, Sergio Guzmao for hosting the, the forum and bringing together the development financial institution at the, this crucial moment. One thing that uh, is clear from uh, Rebecca's intervention is that the, the region is at a, a critical juncture because of the pandemic. Long-standing development challenges and the recent natural disasters. Last year, the gross domestic product lost about, uh, loss was about 7%, the largest for the region in a single year in the last 
two centuries. The pandemic has also led to a severe disruption in the labor market, with millions of full-time jobs lost and a sharp increase in informality. In fact, it is estimated that six in every 10 jobs are now in the informal sector in our region with, with a direct effect on social conditions and people's well-being. As Rebecca also mentioned, millions of people are, have fallen into poverty last year, especially women and kids, shrinking the media class and exacerbating inequality. And the, as children, as students, especially the most vulnerable ones, have lost uh, learning time, we will see big impacts on earning and productivity in overtime. To make uh, matters worse, the fiscal front is also a source of vulnerability, as uh, Rebecca mentioned. The governments in our region reacted vigorously to the emergency and put in place much needed stimulus packages. These, however, implies that fiscal balances and public debt have deteriorated greatly, and the region will need to undergo policy reforms in the years to come that will require consensus and social cohesion. Countries um, are now faced with two paths, as Rebecca mentioned, one of recovery, reinvestment and the renewed opportunity, or one of continued economic deterioration with devastating effects for the last for the for the years to come and future generations. So the question here is what we can do to ensure that Latin America and the Caribbean take the first path. As Rebecca said, we have to modernize our paradigms. We, have, we must be creative in the agenda to, to solve uh, the conjuncture and the structural problems at the same time. We have to be realistic about the challenges, but at the same time, we have to be uh, very optimistic about the opportunities. So that's what I want to talk about today. We launched our strategic uh, blueprint, Vision 2025, which has defined priorities of IDB Group to help the region come out of the crisis stronger and more resilient. Afterwards, I would like to reflect on how the development finance, institu finance institutions can join efforts with government, private sector, and civil society, as Rebecca said, to, to advance those priorities both in Brazil and the rest of the region, of course. Our vision. Our vision is based on five immediate opportunities that we believe will allow the region emerge strong, stronger from the crisis. First, greater regional integration. As you know, COVID crisis offered many prospects for reinvestment. At the bank, we are committed to supporting the regionalization of global value chains to boost private investment, productivity, and employment. Second, digital economy. We have all witnessed how the pandemic accelerated the digital transformation in the region. The countries, companies, and citizens that were able to embrace teleworking, telehealth, and distance learning have been more resilient to the crisis. Innovation is key and the ability of private and public sectors to thrive will depend on their capacity to adopt and develop new technologies. Third, we cannot talk about sustainable recovery without talking about the private sector and small and mid-sized enterprises. They account for the largest share of employment in Latin America and the Caribbean. And at the bank, we are working to help put in place the condition to maximize their contribution to the recovery. We are working to reduce market distortions, foster adequate financing, 
and financial instruments and promote digitalization and innovation to help increase productivity. Fourth, the recovery has also offered a renewed opportunity to promote gender equality and diversity. Women and other vulnerable populations bore the heaviest burden of the health and economic uh, crisis. And the reintegration into the labor mar market is proving difficult. We are committed to continue developing gender-based solutions and mainstreaming gender and diversity considerations into our works across sectors and countries. Finally, a crucial opportunity that emerged from the crisis is the green agenda, as uh, Rebecca said. The investments need to help the region recover from the current crisis must confront the pressing challenge of climate change. To put this in context, climate change damage in the region could cost $100 billion annually by 2050. We cannot afford to pay that cost. We absolutely need to increase climate-friendly investment immediately, reducing emissions and increasing the stock of green infrastructure. This vision is uh, having a concrete impact in, in, in our portfolio. In 2020, for example, the, the IDB approved more than $14 billion, a record high channeling resources into these areas. Our private sector institutions, IDB Invest and IDB Laft, mobilized an additional $9 billion. We have made an extraordinary effort, but we want to do more hand in hand with Brazil and our other partners in the region. As Rebecca mentioned, we need to do more on the financing side. That's the reason why our General Assembly in Barranquilla approved a resolution that creates the conditions to work in a path to increase our resources for the region. And in terms of vaccination, as also Rebecca said, it is key for the recovery. Um, we are working closely on that, uh, on that side with at least 10 countries, not only to finance their vaccines uh, programs, but also to support their vaccines deployment. We mobilized $1 billion for vaccines in the region. And the, Doing more also, of course, means a renewed commitment to multi multilateral collaboration, which brings me to the second topic that I want to discuss today. How can development finance institutions join efforts to forge a path to recovery in Brazil and in the rest of the region? The, the role of this institution is more important now than ever before. Over the last four years, the IDB has constructed a strategic partnership with the DFIs in the region through our close work with many of the organizations present here today. Looking forward, I see enormous opportunities for collaboration to support IDB Group's priority. Our goal, as reflecting in our longstanding partnership with the ABDE, is to help position Brazilian development financial institutions as key players in leveraging needed investment for Brazil's sustainable economic recovery. Now, I would like to highlight the opportunities we see going forward with a few concrete examples on, of ongoing work in Brazil in partnership with many of the participants of, uh, in this event. For example, to support job creation through small and uh, medium enterprises, we supported Brazilian development financial institutions to structure programs for over $1 billion during 2020. To support the digitalization and efficiency of uh, development financial institutions to improve credit access, we supported the development of local and regional market connectivity for small businesses with Banco Nacional de Desenvolvimiento Económico y Social and uh, IDB's network Connect Americas. 
Third, to help close gender gaps. What we have done, we supported pilot programs that target women women lead business for financing, such as in the case of the Extreme South Development Bank of Brazil and the Development Bank of Espiritu Santo. We have also developed jointly with the Brazilian Development Association an ambitious agenda to assess Brazilian small businesses and barriers to access to credit from a gender perspective and to address climate change. We are supporting develop, development financial institutions to become key players in structuring public-private partnerships for sustainable infrastructure and risk sharing mechanisms. As in the case of our close collaboration with Caixa Economica Federal and the Brazilian Development Bank. In the same line, we are also supporting Brazilian development financial institutions to participate in the local sustainable bond markets, such as we did the Minagerais, uh, with the Minagerais Development Bank, the first Brazilian institution to issue a sustainable development gold bond. The pressing uh, challenge of climate change is uh, at the forefront of the multi multilateral agenda and our institutions have an essential role addressing this global public good. In the last year, the, the, the last years, the IDB has lent over $2 billion, $2 billion, enabling development financial institutions to leverage over $4 billion in private investment essential for green recovery of the region. This includes, for example, supporting uh, electromobility, programs in Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia, and uh, developing innovative risk sharing uh, and insurance mechanisms to support the energy efficient technology conversion and upgrading for enterprises in several countries in the, in the region. In this regard, I am very pleased to announce that tomorrow uh, the, the IDB will be launching the Green Bond Transparency Platform, the first tool uh, to make information on these instruments accessible and comparable to everyone interested in participating, interested in participating in the region's market, free of charge. We have to contribute to the expansion of this market, of course, bringing together key players committed to the sustainable development uh, cause. So let me let me stop here. And uh, speaking of key players, maybe we could uh, go back to, to Rebecca. Muito bem. Uh, bom, imensamente gratos. Very well. Thank you very much uh, for both of you, uh, both of your participations. Um, Rebecca and, Greenspan, and Mr. Richard Martinez Alvarado, thank you very much for enriching this moment. This is only the first day of our forum, and it's already very good. Uh, so for final remarks about the addressed topic, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, Richard, for such, such a, a good intervention. And also to, to explain what are the uh, wide instrumental, the, uh, operational instrumentalization that you have developed for helping the countries. Let me, let me just uh, uh, say, maybe to finalize, uh, that, that the issue of the labor market of the unemployment, the abilities of the people to get back to work is a key issue for the future, no doubt. There is a different a, a labor market out there and we have to prepare our young, our women, and also to transform some of the abilities that many have had and that need to enter this new, this new world. Now, one issue that I want to highlight that I didn't do during my presentation is the need 
to take the right decisions for the women economic empowerment path because the lack of conciliation between work and family can affect many women and be a real obstacle and challenge for women to go back to work after the pandemic. And let me say that from a development point of view, this is an issue that, ha that needs to be addressed. Also in terms of the small and medium size enterprises, because many of those that were not able to make it because of the pandemic were in the hands of women, <laughs> because the micro and small enterprises were in the hands of women. So we need not only guarantee schemes or credit, we need also support for the transformation, for the, for the transformation of the business model of those very small micro and small enterprises that were in the hands of women. And here, I think that the national and subnational development banks can make really a difference, especially because of what they have said before, because they can they go for the local credit markets. They understand what they need and they can, at the same time of giving more credit, giving support for the transformation of the uh, uh, of the uh, model, the business model, uh, the digitalization of the micro and small enterprises will be very important, and will be very important to get back to work uh, for many. Oh, because, as Richard said, the uh, 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 small and medium enterprises are the main employers in our region. So let's put attention to the labor market. Let's put attention to the needs of women and young people in the labor market. And let's put attention on the needs of the very small, the micro small enterprises that if we want to recover the uh, entrepreneurial networks that we had before the pandemic, we need to give more support to this sector. And I think that the development, the national development banks, with the help of the international development banks, can uh, make a difference in that in in that sense. I I will finish saying also that uh, we need a huge investment in science and technology again, because this uh, this pandemic has shown us the importance of science for development, and I think that uh, our region is under investing in science and technology, in our tertiary education that needs, you know, to be pushed, not, a, a, not a, a, a weakened in this, in this pandemic. I think that the vaccination, or the, the, the reality that we have 10 vaccines right now in the market is a huge success of science. Uh, the problem has been the governance. <laughs> the failure in the world has been the governance part, but science has been a huge success. We need also to invest much more in, in science and technology for the future. So thank you, thank you very much again, and thank you, Richard, for, for, for your uh, intervention. Senora Hebeke, please. E vamos seguir, então, agora... Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks to you, uh, Ms. Rebecca Greenspan. And now we give the floor to Richard for his final remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And just a, a, a quick uh, message. Um, adding, uh, adding to what the Rebecca said, uh, friends, the challenges and the, the opportunities ahead are historic. We can, of course, continue discussing, but this is more like a call to action. Uh, at, the, at the IDB group, we have a vision to help the region come out of the crisis stronger, and the, that is our contribution. So we invite you all to deepen uh, our partnership to make inclusive recovery a reality. 
uh, the work that the DFIs do is critical, uh, and now more than ever, uh, we need to coordinate efforts to support the, the, the region to avoid another uh, lost decade, as, as Rebecca mentioned. We have a great team in Brazil, led by an extraordinary representative, Morgan Doyle. Uh, so we are pleased to work with many Brazilian DFIs in this effort, uh, both with lending and uh, to improve how to, to address their particular needs. Finally, I, I would like to, to, to thank to the Brazilian Development Association for these opportunities. Obrigado.